actually got, I think, and of course there is a bit of a bias because it's the panel which I'm chairing, but it's also true. We've got a very, very interesting, fantastic panel with some illustrious, I'm going to use that phrase, um, practitioners from Hong Kong and from Australia and from Singapore. Um, I dare say that the topics that we're going to look at are interesting as well. And what I will do, first of all, is to introduce everyone. So our first panel member is Hamdel Hack, aka Hack, um, who is in Singapore, uh, Raja and Tan. Um, Hack joined Raja and Tan in Singapore as a partner after experience with the AG's Chambers in Singapore and the Commercial Affairs Department as well. He was recently recognized as one of the world's leading investigators by Who's Who Legal 2019. He's recognized as one of the leading advisors in the chapter of uh, White Collar Crime, the Experts Guide 2018, and was recommended in Best of Best 2017 for White Collar Crime. He was a deep, uh, the Deputy Senior State Counsel and Deputy Public Prosecutor of the Criminal Justice Division of the Attorney General's Chambers. Um, his work involved while he was there, prosecution of matters relating to corporations, securities, civil penalty actions for market misconduct under the Securities and Futures Act, and he headed the legal department uh, in the CAD for eight years. In private practice, um, his work covers advice to corporations or disclosure obligations, as well as money laundering matters under the Corruption, Drug Trafficking and Serious Crime Confiscation of Benefits Act in respect of confiscation and asset recovery. So obviously in very relevant to what we do in Chambers, he hack, presently heads the Indonesian desk of Raja and Tan in Singapore. And I'm just going to highlight a couple of uh, cases that Hack has been involved in. Uh, you will probably recognize his name. Petrobras, Brazil, cross-border investigation, a huge and sprawling corruption case that's probably taken up most of the jurisdictions across the world. And of course, that other huge case emanating from uh, the Far East, one MBD. And I'm sure he's got some uh, amazing stories to tell about that. I can highly recommend the book, Billion Dollar Whale, which is all about one MBD read it it's fantastic and once you do you'll realize how extraordinary that fraud was and of course hack was perhaps fortunate enough to be involved in that litigation um, he's been involved in dozens if not um, multiple dozens of cases which will probably take me about half an hour to go through save to say that his experience is rather phenomenal uh, he is widely recognized as one of the leading lights in singapore and we are absolutely delighted to have him him on our panel. Um, and here he is with, with, with the background, uh, corporate background uh, behind him as well. So thank you very much. He's also the owner of one of the best moustaches I've seen in <laughs> legal practice and long may that continue. Thank you. <laughs> Andrew Powner, who is in Hong Kong at Haldanes, has been in practice for over 25 years. I'm not quite sure if he's going to appreciate me saying that, but Andrew, there it is, 25 years. He's defended many large-scale white-collar criminal cases brought by the Independent Commission Against Corruption and the Commercial Crime Bureau. He's represented clients before the Securities and Futures Commission, the Stock Exchange of uh, Hong Kong, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, and the Hong Kong Immigration, Customs and Excise Departments. He, in practice, uh, assists uh, the pro uh, in the prosecution and detection of crime and has advised companies on possible criminal conduct by directors and employees, including advice to victims of crime, which of course is a fascinating uh, new aspect to the work that we all already do. Andrew has, got, uh, has developed strong international ties, having represented clients from a wide range of countries for all sorts of offenses, including extradition, fraud, money laundering, and computer crime as well. Um, some fantastic criminal, notable criminal cases as well, the uh, MTR public inquiry, if anyone knows about recent uh, criminal litigation in Hong Kong, that's one of the big ones. Um, MTR, the MTR railway line and the construction and criminal aspects of what took place during that construction process. He's one of the first uh, ever advocates to have uh, undertaken a trial partly in mainland China, using Hong Kong law as a letter of request which was before a Hong Kong judge and a Chinese judge at the same time. Uh, and that 
uh, it, it, that is fascinating. And I'm sure that Andrew, uh, we will ask him to tell us a little bit more about that case. Uh, also highlights uh, a case representing or concerning rather the, uh, the president of Italy, former president of Italy, not the current president of Italy. Um, we can probably all guess which one. Um, he represented Hong Kong companies who were on trial in Milan, jointly charged with that said former Italian uh, president. Also uh, proceedings concerning the president of Egypt uh, and was the lead solicitor in the very significant Shanghai land trial, uh, which uh, concluded fairly recently. Described as extremely reliable, hardworking and dedicated, very experienced, according to his peers, who rates him very highly for his first cl class corporate crime practice. He's one of the leading individuals in criminal litigation as per Chambers Asia Client Guide and winner of the Asian Law Awards Managing Partner of the Year, no doubt voted by those who he manages in the firm. Um, we are very, very honoured and grateful to have uh, Andrew represent us. He's extremely well dressed in his office at quarter past nine in the evening. And uh, that just shows dedication to uh, our panel. And we're very, very grateful. He should be at home with his family, but no, he's speaking to us and said, thank you very much, Andrew. We will be delighted to hear from you. And finally, Finally, um, we have Robert Wilde, who is in Australia, in Australia at past midnight. So um, you win, uh, Robert, for the dedication in terms of staying in the office literally past the day which you should be there. Thank you very much indeed. Um, from Johnson, Winston and Slatley in Australia, one of the leading firms there. Robert is a dispute resolution lawyer specialising in competition, international trade and anti-corruption law. He's advised national and international clients on banking, securities, aviation, construction, power and energy and uh, dispute resolution coming from those particular practice areas, including arbitration as well. His work has a particular focus on competition, commercial crime and fraud, anti-corruption, bribery investigations and prosecutions, sanctions and extradition work. He's the co-chair of the International Bar Association's Anti-Corruption Committee from 2015 to 2016, regularly appears in the media, uh, for bribery and corruption issues and was recognised in 2018 and 2020's Who's Who Legal Guide to Thought Leaders Investigations and then 2019 Who's Who Legal Guide to Investigations as a leading individual and he is the only person in Australia to have received those accolades. So how on earth uh, each of our panel members actually finds time to sleep after doing all that work is beyond me but we are lucky to have them and we are going to and I'm going to get straight into it so we use the time efficiently. We're going to cover four topics uh, and if time allows, and only if time allows, go on to the fifth. Those topics are first uh, MLA, uh, secondly we're going to talk about cooperation between each of the jurisdictions that our panellists come from and some comments about those jurisdictions, level of cooperation, what it takes to gain cooperation and so on. Uh, topic three, asset recovery, civil and criminal asset recovery, what works best for foreign parties coming in looking to enforce their judgments and awards. Topic four, extradition, how each of the jurisdictions deals with extradition, which I'm sure will be very interesting to a number of our, uh, our guests to the conference. And if we've got time, some trends and developments in each of those particular jurisdictions. Can I jump into it then? And can I start with you, Robert, if you would be so kind? Um, Australia and MLA, formal MLA, and if I can call it this, informal L MLA. Uh, can you help us with formal MLA? What's the process that's used uh, for MLA uh, in the formal sense? And can you give us some assistance as to how that process is doing? Does it work? Uh, good morning, good evening, and good night to everybody. Um, <laughs> yes, um, yes, it does work, um, but um, it is a it is a very statutory driven process. Um, it's very procedural, uh, and it's very time consuming. It is used extensively by um, the Commonwealth Public Prosecutor, who has responsibility for Commonwealth offences in Australia, and for state DPPs for more domestic related crimes, or both of them, if there's a joint task force into some particular conduct. Um, it is quite technical and it is cumbersome and it is slow and lengthy, but it is a process that 
is used a lot. Primarily, it's been used probably over the last 10 years in tax and revenue driven investigations, fraud, and essentially sort of a criminal conduct on the revenue system. And that has proved, I think, quite successful for the revenue authorities in prosecuting international tax offences. If you talk about the informal process, um, that is used far more extensively and very effectively by the Australian Federal Police, who I will refer to as the AFP. Um, and they work extensively with their counterparts across the world. And gone are the days of um, slow, uh, mini formal requests. Uh, they're on uh, WeChat, if <laughs> there's a Chinese connection, they're on WhatsApp. Um, and they know their connections, they know their counterparts at the, the FBI um, or the equivalent police authorities or uh, corruption bureaus um, across Asia, across the world, frankly. And the first thing they will do is when they see something in the media or an inquiry in foreign media uh, triggers the interest of a foreign organization and a foreign authority, they'll be onto the, the, webs, the, the chat forums and they'll be saying, what do you know about this? Or this has come to our attention. And, and that is increasingly how um, significant investigations are triggered in Australia. So do I understand then that actually um, from being, and this may be slightly unfair, criticised for um, how slow the process was, um, it's actually changed where um, Australian um, police officers and investigators are going out there at keeping an eye on what, what is happening and reaching out to their colleagues in different jurisdictions to see if they can help. Is that, is that a fair description? That is a fair description, but I also have to say that um, they tend through limited resources, initially some pretty limited capability in terms of the knowledge of commercial crime or the knowledge of the commercial sector full stop. And um, uh, I have a current case running that went through a committal proceeding and uh, one of the initial investigators um, knew nothing about foreign bribery and knew nothing about the commercial context of what he was starting to investigate. He was an old fashioned traditional police investigator who would recognize your traditional stereotype of a fraudster. But um, it has improved over the last decade or so, but it is slow and the resourcing issues, as Amanda said obviously earlier, is a significant ongoing issue in Australia because there have been constant cost cutting processes by governments to save money. And if they balance books, they feel happy. But in balancing books, it means that resources to tackle serious issues get diverted or drained away. So it's a it's a complex scene as much here as it is in other countries. Yeah, yeah that's very, thank you, Andrew, uh, Robert, that's very useful. Andrew, can I, can I turn to you um, uh, and ask you about Hong Kong and MLA, um, formal MLA and informal channel with MLA. Got your mute, Andrew. Yep, I just managed that first, of course. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, similar to Robert. Yes, it's uh, statute driven initially, although they're actually called ordinances here. And yeah, quite strict requirements uh, from our DOJ. And talking to the um, International Law Division here, um, they're actually quite proactive about this. So when requests come in for MLA, if they're not satisfied that all of the necessary criteria are met, they actually have dialogue uh, you know, with the other countries to try to see if they can help to try and uh, be as cooperative as they can. Um, the uh, informal MLA, I'd say, um, has actually increased quite a lot because of COVID. Um, okay. I mean, yeah, without going into too many details, I mean, Hack and I have a, a, a case that we're, we're dealing with together from Hong Kong and Singapore. And because of COVID and the inability of clients to travel, et cetera, um, we are doing deals with other countries um, off the books, if you want to call it like that. Mm. Uh, to, to give the cooperation that they need, but off the normal statutes, it's quite interesting. And we're doing the same with another trial that I'm involved in um, with uh, evidence from New Zealand that we need to obtain next year. So dealing with the prosecutors to try and get um, documentary and video evidence that wouldn't otherwise be available if, if you have the consent of, of both sides. 
And, and um, what's, what's the capability of investigators? Um, are they up to speed with relevant uh, procedures, mechanisms and, and, uh, and law, especially cross-jurisdictional issues? Uh, well, I think they're trying to catch up with the criminals, basically. Uh, I mean, it's something <laughs> later about reforms that are needed. But the speed of some of the requests coming over mean that by the time it lands in Hong Kong, and I think you gave an example earlier about fraud in England then being uh, brought over to Hong Kong, often the, the police and the, um, the cyber security experts here are unable to actually track the money quickly enough and it's already disappeared uh, before right. we get our hands on it and our investigators start making moves. So that's something that I think global police forces and prosecutorial authorities are, are looking at and I, I know that they are here as well and so they're helping us to do things in an informal way as well. Sometimes we can freeze a bank account on a phone call to the police. Oh wow. So they, they can actually start acting very, very quickly. And then the client doesn't have time to give evidence. So I go to the police station. I give a witness statement on behalf of my client with my client on the phone in America or England. Uh, I'm essentially becoming a, a prosecution witness, if you like, on behalf of the client company. And wow. then we have to take that immediately following my call and, and me giving evidence based on their instructions. So it's heavily provisoed. Uh, that actually the client will fly somebody over as soon as possible to give a witness statement themselves so that they take over from me if there's an arrest and they're, ca they're called as PW1. Well, well that, that, that is a bit different to what happens here. And I have to say the idea of me becoming any sort of uh, witness of, of, of fact, I think will probably terrify most people. So rather, rather you than me, um, uh, frankly, but... Heavily provided. <laughs> Uh, there's a connection, of course, between Hong Kong and Singapore insofar as that they are both, uh, in inverted commas, offshore jurisdictions. And so money flows uh, and behaviour um, coming into Hong Kong and Singapore uh, sometimes can be quite considerable from, a, um, from an international perspective. Can I ask about Singapore, Hack? Can I ask you about um, the formal MLA process, uh, a sketch as to how it works? Uh, and informal cooperation. Do you have informal, do you give informal cooperation? Yeah. Is there such a thing? Is it something which is becoming more popular now? Yeah. Can you tell us about well, that? I, I can tell you a little bit more because I've had the benefit of being on the other side. So I've been working on the government side before. Oh, yeah. And I can tell you that the informal is actually a very effective tool. The police will actually use their uh, contacts in various jurisdictions to communicate and share information. But there is a limit to how you can use this information because uh, any kind of evidence that is being shared cannot be used in court. So uh, it is more to get a heads up or to get uh, the process going and to move things along. So the informal net network and of course, with the financial intelligence units of each country, I think that helps on the white collar crime areas because they can connect on that uh, network. And I think that has been very effective following all the Agmon meetings that they've been having. So that's one good thing that comes out of there. Yeah, and, and Singapore now, has had some criticism from, from Egmont and, and various other um, similar organisations uh, in respect sure. of the level of cooperation that they give international investigators. Is that they fair do. criticism? Uh, well, it, it's fair? yes and no, because you see, you must bear in mind that we have a significant banking secrecy provision. So yes. a lot of it has to be done through the processes. You need to go to court to get the relevant information through the relevant production orders and restraint orders, uh, which is permitted uh, by the formal processes. But unfortunately, uh, some of the countries that want to get all of these are not reciprocating. So reciprocity is one of the key components in a formal mutual legal assistance process. Yeah. And that's why only some of the countries have been uh, listed you know, to, for assistance. And uh, even in those cases, I think there is to be an element of reasonableness in the request. So Singapore also has a part to play in assessing the quality of the request. And it has been turned down in some occasions. But I can tell you, it is a very robust and active area because we've got uh, MLAs with the likes of India, Hong Kong, Australia, um, Switzerland, uh, England, USA. A lot of these countries are actually uh, relating with Singapore on this. 
there are two aspects. One is the coercive process, and then the other is the consensual process, which means to help in assisting in getting statements. The other, of course, would be to uh, actually go through a whole court procedure. I, let me share with you one quick example. Uh, yeah. I had a case where uh, Japan had uh, were, was looking into this Olympus fraud and they had a witness in Singapore, they wanted to talk to him. So they came through the MLA process formally for a consensual statement, it was rejected. Two months later, the Japanese government requested through official channels to actually obtain this statement through the court process in which the Singapore prosecutors go to court. And then this witness was compelled to go to court in order to give the same evidence, uh, which of course, uh, in some cases, it would have been better off for that person to have given the consensual one. Uh, like, for example, in another case, uh, to avoid extradition, somebody had, uh, on a UK request, immediately provided a consensual statement just so as to avoid this, uh, this rigmarole of going to court. Yeah. So it, it, it's, it's, it's very vibrant in that space, and Singapore has been very cooperative in providing assistance. Fantastic. I mean, it feels like I'm opening a bit of a Pandora's box to even mention the subject of MLA in respect of all of your jurisdictions. Um, and uh, we could probably fill an entire panel discussion just, just on the topic of MLA, because uh, there's much to cover. But thank you all. That is extremely uh, interesting uh, and gives a good flavour as to how each of, those juris each of your jurisdictions is uh, currently um, dealing with MLA requests. Um, and on that point, cooperation. Um, and in fact, I'm going to ask slightly different questions when it comes to cooperation with respect to each of your jurisdictions. And the reason for that, I hope, will become clear in a moment. Can I start with you, Andrew? Uh, and on the topic of cooperation, in particular, the relationship between Hong Kong and China, the cooperative relationship, or maybe there isn't a cooperative relationship between Hong Kong and China. Uh, can, you, can you help us with the extent of cross-border Hong Kong-China cooperation? Yes, now that really is a Pandora's box. <laughs> um, as you all know, at the moment, uh, there's been a lot of controversy here over the national security law. Uh, it's caused quite a lot of social unrest, as did the introduction of a proposed extradition law last year that mm. would include extradition to China. Uh, believe it or not, although it's the same country, um, there's no extradition between Hong Kong and China. There's only informal rendition agreements and that, that's still the case now. But what's going on at the moment is that yes, they've introduced a national security law. Um, it has caused enormous controversy here. But one of the disappointing aspects actually is that various um, Commonwealth countries have withdrawn cooperation with Hong Kong as a result. Um, mm. That effectively um, makes Hong Kong a bit of a haven for criminals. So in the past, we've had very active extradition and MLA with America, Australia, Canada, um, and the UK, of course. All of that has been suspended uh, because of the extradition law, whilst people are examining it because it's rather vaguely drafted, etc. cetera. Um, but if, you know, for many of us, we take the view that's just simply not necessary mm. uh, because in order to cooperate under the MLA treaties or under extradition treaties, there's got to be dual criminality anyway. So there's got to be a crime in both jurisdictions. And there's already protections in all these treaties for political crimes. So if any country believes that somebody's being extradited for a national security law offence that isn't a crime in their country, don't extradite them. Hmm. It doesn't mean that you have to suspend the entire treaty. Uh, that's, that's part of the problem. So that at the moment, yeah, we're, we're in a bit of a limbo. But dealing with China in particular, because that's, that's where we began, um, the cooperation with China is increasing more and more. Um, Hong Kong is now being uh, invited to be part of the Greater Bay Area, which will extend all the way around the Shenzhen Peninsula, uh, Guangdong, et cetera, and across to Macau. Lawyers are being invited to take exams to actually become part of that so they can operate cross-border uh, in both China and in Hong Kong. And uh, several of our associates are planning to take those exams. So that, that, that's going to increase considerably. But even before that, if I can go on for another moment, if you like. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
there was already a great deal of cooperation. Now, in criminal law, um, we were one of the pioneers here because we had a person who had allegedly committed a crime in China, but had gone to live a Chinese national and had gone to live in America. Well, there is no extradition between China and America. No. And what had happened is the money had come through Hong Kong. So they were quite clever. They discovered this. And so Hong Kong extradited the person from America to Hong Kong to stand trial here for money laundering, not the substantive offence. Oh, I China. see. Money laundering, because the proceeds of crime came through here. Yeah. Now, because virtually all the prosecution witnesses were senior uh, members of law enforcement agencies in mainland China, they didn't want to come to Hong Kong to give evidence. So what the prosecution did uh, through letters of request is asked if the Hong Kong court could cross-examine them in the People's Court of mainland China. It was agreed and off we all went on a coach. Very happy outing for two months. All the prosecution team, all the defence team, the Hong Kong judge, all the stenographers and the court clerks, the entire Hong Kong court moved to the People's Court and the Hong Kong judge sat next to one of the uh, mainland judges. So he took over one entire courtroom for the, the couple of months and the mainland judge introduced himself to each witness and explained that Hong Kong law would apply, not mainland law because it's Hong Kong procedures. All of this, of course, filmed and, and stenographers, etc. Then each witness was cross-examined under Hong Kong law, which is similar to UK law. Cross-examined, re-examined, et cetera. Uh, counsel could make submissions. The Hong Kong judge then took over the entire proceedings. So when it was finished and we'd finished all of their witnesses, the entire transcript was signed, et cetera, brought back to Hong Kong. And that became the body of our trial in Hong Kong. The client, of course, was on bail in Hong Kong and, and could listen in, uh, but couldn't travel to China because that would have been dangerous for him anyway. And then the, the body of the trial, all the final submissions took place in Hong Kong with the China evidence admitted. And I'm pleased to say he was acquitted with costs. Fantastic. That, that, that's the most important part. But I, I mean, there is therefore um, some, dare I say, creativity between, uh, between both territories uh, which would uh, which allow cases like that to progress where otherwise they'll be running into difficulties where um, they, they couldn't administer the trial properly. I mean, that, that, that is a fascinating... That's Just a fascinating a story. Case, if you like. Mm. Uh, well, cross-examining a very, very senior official from mainland China uh, with a, a, actually a British QC who was here, uh, yeah. so a mixed team, uh, she put to this very senior prosecutor, you know, in your illustrious career, how many... Uh, persons have you uh, managed to to uh, prosecute and you know it's many many thousands and and how many of those uh, have been convicted all of them <laughs> well I mean there you go that's silks for you just don't know where to ask the right question do they <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> I, I dare say that was no doubt entirely true as well I have to say um Brilliant. I mean, I, uh, that, that sounds like a topic, in, again, in and of itself. But I, I, can, can I move on to, to Robert and your perspective, Robert, in Australia in respect of cross-border corporate uh, crime investigations? Um, a review in, short, in, in a short few uh, sentences. How, how is it going, for want of a better term? Uh, very... Um reactively for many years, a little bit more proactive now. They had, um, our authorities, as I said earlier, had limited resources, limited people, and the Leighton's case uh, kicked along most spectacularly <clears throat> by the Unaroyal admissions by the Asani family is the prime example of um, a corruption case that uh, lingered for a decade um, when it first surfaced, um, primarily through the media. Um, there were some spectacular um, failures by the corporate regulator to uh, prosecute a former CFO um, who uh, got roundly badly treated by his district court judge and was um, unanimously um, 
uh, justified and beatified by the Court of Appeal, Criminal Appeal, when he was acquitted. Um, but that is an example of a 10-year investigation where not a lot happened as far as the public were concerned and the OECD were constantly banging on to the authorities about what is going on with these cases and why is nothing happening because your enforcement record is going from low to low to a blip to medium and back to low. Um, mm. But having said that, I, as I said earlier, the cooperation is much better. And I, I have no doubt that as a result of uh, the Unaroyal Asani admissions and the cases that eventuated in London uh, with recent convictions this year, that in fact uh, now, um, about two weeks ago, the police executed search warrants and they uh, arrested uh, one person in Australia, a former executive, and they've got two outstanding warrants and possible extradition uh, proceedings for another two individuals who are likely to, to face charges subject to those extradition proceedings um, kicking off. So that is a case that is 10 years in the making and will be slow and long and probably another five years before it even surfaces. So in this country, it is very long, very slow, very tedious um, and ultimately um, poorly resourced um, from a finance point of view. Uh, prosecutors will no doubt object to this and say it's outrageous and they're doing what they can and they are doing what they can. But the reality is, is that unless something is badge, national security, counterterrorism, uh, or something like that, and the modern vogue now is foreign interference, then um, it doesn't see the light of day in terms of resourcing. Um, they do what they can, um, but it's, it, it, is, it is working and it's working much better. And I think um, they have to be given credit as our authorities have improved their level of uh, um, backdoor cooperation and behind the scenes cooperation to gather their evidence and then make the decision whether to prosecute. But we still have very, very few cases here. So, we like so to regard ourselves as not entirely corrupt, oh, just I'm, mildly so. I'm, I'm sure that's in, in, entirely accurate. Uh, ha having said that, you, you do have a large um, extraction industry in Australia, which uh, tends to have very, very international operations in, in, dare I say, jurisdictions, which sadly um, are perhaps more affected with, co uh, with corruption than, than mainland Aus than, than Australia is. So um, uh, very, very much so. Mm -hmm. So, Sorry, so bribery and corruption cases are, are, are not necessarily entirely confined to within the borders of Australia, but because of the work that Australian industry does, um, it can find itself um, caught up in all sorts of difficulties in other territories as well. Is that fair? It exactly does. And much of, much of my work is the internal investigative work in that area, in Africa and across Asia. And one of the great debilitating features of our system is that we have no DPAs here. And so therefore, is there, is no obligation to rep there is no obligation to report anything. Government has sat on reform for five, if not nearly six years now, and nothing has happened. Um, they keep saying they're very close, but then they backtrack uh, yeah. and nothing happens because something else becomes more important. And so the first thing companies ask me is, um, should I report? And if not, why not? And there is still here a significant culture of the, um, the police are... Um, less to be trusted than any other regulator and you don't go and volunteer things particularly if they're offshore and particularly if they're too hard to find so that that environment uh, makes it very counterproductive to volunteering information um, mm. unless of course you have an american parent or for example an english parent mm. and because your obligations then flow through to subsidiaries and that that might then in turn affect how um your Australian subsidiary or interest in an Australian venture might then um, respond to a claim like that. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting perspective. And, and no doubt why uh, you need Australian law perspective, because uh, um, it, it's, it's a very different set of circumstances and considerations than if you were in difficulties in the United Kingdom or the US. So um, thank you for that. That's, that's really, really useful. Um, how, can I ask you uh, in respect of Singapore and uh, cross-border criminal investigations. Is cooperation easy to come by? Um, what can you ask for? Can you give us some examples of successful cooperation? Yes. Okay, uh, let's put extradition aside in this discussion mm -hmm. and we'll talk about the assistance that is being provided by mostly the enforcement bodies between uh, Singapore, usually we look, uh, we start with our neighbors, you know, whether it is uh, 
Malaysia, Brunei, Indonesia kind of thing. Uh, one thing to note, uh, Singapore and Malaysia and Brunei, we share a sort of a common procedure code which allows for our warrants and summonses to be uh, endorsed and enforced in each other's country. So that makes things a mm -hmm. lot easier. Uh, so it is actually uh, an impingement on sovereignty in a, in a sense, but uh, that's how the historical framework was such that uh, a warrant in Singapore can be enforced in Malaysia, as an example. Now, I, I mentioned that I only because... That. That, that, yeah. that, that's very, very interesting. So, so do, do you get a sense of um, uh, forum shopping then, where, where, where uh, there, there are warrants obtained in Singapore because it's easier and better well, to do Well, the it. cooperation between Singapore and Malaysia is extremely tight. I mean, very good. Uh, so there, there's a lot of sharing. Even if you don't have this... Uh, legal procedures in place, they would be working together hand in hand to try to make sure that, you know, the efforts at prosecuting and enforcement is obtained. Now, yeah. this brings me to the, uh, before I, I, I talk about China and all that, I, I want to just finish off by talking about this very good relationship between Singapore and Malaysia in relation to the 1MDB case. Yeah. So they were working so closely that they created even a joint task force uh, in which both the Malaysian and Singapore uh, police officers combine in a task force as well as at the prosecution level. So there was working committees that went and worked together to try to work out and, and uh, ferret out where all the monies have gone to and in Malaysia and, and elsewhere. Now, of course, this was particularly difficult at the initial period because the prime minister uh, involved had appointed an attorney general who was uh, particularly inclined to a certain view that suggests that there was no predicate offence in Malaysia. And that caused mayhem in terms of the work that could be done in, mm. and in other countries, not only Singapore, but in Switzerland, US and, and Europe. Uh, but soon after the change in government had taken place and the new AG had come in and we were able to get to the brass tacks of establishing the predicate offences, the cooperation went to a high level and a lot of information was exchanged and that quickly led to the subsequent prosecutions of high level officials in Malaysia with successful yeah. outcomes recently. So that's one part. Um, the other thing I thought I should share with you was our role in the region. Singapore plays an extremely important role in assistance, especially to China, Taiwan, Hong Kong. So we are in a bit of a triumvirate where if China can't talk to Taiwan, they come through Singapore and Singapore does all the communication assistance uh, officially and unofficially uh, mm. with Hong Kong as well. So we, we play that uh, middleman role quite often in law enforcement. So I've seen instances where both the official and the unofficial takes place. Another very interesting thing you'll notice about China also sometimes they don't want to go by the rule book. Uh, in order to enforce some of their uh, laws, you see some of the Chinese money comes to the Singapore banks and yeah. uh, the officials sometimes, instead of going through the regulatory process, they'll fly to Singapore and put pressure on that Chinese citizen who may have become a Singapore citizen by now and make them send the money back. And is that right? And, uh, it, oh yeah, it happens quite a number of times. I've There's seen a, that. A summary uh, form of asset recovery. Uh, yeah, <laughs> most effective. <laughs> Uh, and, and I, think, <laughs> I think there are threats direct or indirect in relation to what's going on in mainland. So that's how monies are then sent back. So those are some of the things I thought I'd share with you. And yeah. one last point, uh, yeah. not on uh, white collar crime, but there is always this issue of uh, death penalty scen scenarios when assistance yeah. is sought by Singapore. Uh, countries like Australia and, and, and UK uh, would probably want to insist that they will not agree to some deals unless there is no death penalty element involved in all of this. So yeah. that's that sort of the framework, which may not be experienced by you because you don't have the death penalty. No, quite good. Um, and have they found Joe Lowe yet or is he still hiding somewhere? He is, I believe, in China and... Um, probably well protected because there are people who say that he's an asset, right? Uh, intelligence asset of some governments. A very interesting man. Read the book, everyone. It is genuinely, genuinely fascinating, I have to say. Uh, I, I can say he's not in England. 
that that I, I can I can assure you. <laughs> um, uh, and we, we you you did touch upon uh, the I think we call it the the expedited form of asset recovery. Can I talk about more traditional forms of asset recovery? Um, civil versus criminal asset recovery. And if I can stay with you, Hack, actually. Yeah. Um, asset recovery in in Singapore. Uh, is there is there a culture of post judgment asset recovery when in on the criminal as on the in the criminal jurisdiction? Is it something that Sing the Singapore authorities uh, actively pursue? So, um, yeah, so generally, the, we are hamstrung by the banking secrecy rules. So you know yeah. how it is. So it's either you come through the criminal route and, and try and get the orders first through restraint orders and then post restraint, you uh, or a confiscation order that can be recognized in Singapore. And that will be pursued, uh, of course, with the proper challenges that can be provided in court. So that takes up, uh, I would say, 30 to 40% of the cases. But more often than not, people are left to pursue recovery through civil means. Mm. And oftentimes, we are stuck because we, we have difficulties following the money trail. Uh, at best, you can get uh, court orders through the Norwich Pharmacal orders, and mm. it sort of ends there most times because the money would have Gone. Typically, it always runs to China. I see this as a pattern. You know, oh, uh, right? okay. for example, I was uh, in exactly this time last year in December. There was a few hundred million dollars that was taken out uh, by fraud out of a European company, and the monies were immediately sent to Singapore. And uh, we were notified about it very quickly. I got on the phone, told uh, the enforcement people about it. They acted within the hour, but within that hour, the money had all gone to China. Within million. that hour, a hundred million, two hundred million. Oh, sorry, I was only halfway there. <laughs> yeah. Gosh, okay. And 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 China's a bit of a in terms of recovery of money. Uh, it's a black it's hole. A of a, yeah, legal. Uh, that's exactly the phrase I was going to use. Actually, it's a bit of a legal black hole. I mean, you might as well go to to, to North Korea or Saudi Arabia or something. The, the idea of getting enforcement of your judgment and award in, in China is, um, how should I say, um, you would live more in hope than expectation. Interesting, okay. Um, and uh, can I uh, ask, uh, can I turn to you, uh, Robert, and your experiences in respect of asset recovery in Hong Kong? Um, Civil actions, or or should I make a criminal complaint if I'm the victim of fraud? Um, in Sydney, I'll let Andrew speak about Hong Kong, but right. um, <laughs> that's all right. Uh, in term, we're very similar to yeah. uh, Singapore in some respects. That is, most people are left with their own civil uh, rights and remedies, and very rarely do they ever recover anything back unless you've managed to. Um, injunct someone um, on whatever basis you've got, um, ex parte generally and without notice. So uh, that can work. It's not always there. It's costly, it's expensive, mm -hmm. and you only do it when you know that there's something there and you have to move, as Huck said, like lightning. Mm -hmm. um, the, criminal pro the criminal side is more interesting because our Proceeds of Crime Act um, can, and I have used it in one case for a liquidator, to... Um, to, to respond to about $50 million of assets that were being held by the liquidator. And um, it arose out of uh, questionable dealings uh, on antitrust conduct in the US. And so it triggered our authorities to be able to act um, on the suspicion of foreign offences. And they took steps to restrain the proceeds, about 50 million. And then the, the funds were ultimately forfeit. And then uh, there is a discretionary process that um, victims of um, the conduct, um, be they um, American victims or Australian victims, can apply to the minister for a discretionary payment, effectively a form of compensation. Oh, so um, compens that compensation is, out of the confiscation then? And, and... Correct, correct, out of the consolidated revenue fund that is administered by a trustee on behalf of the Commonwealth. Um, that <laughs> is a process that um, is rarely used and in fact is it's something that some people um, if there are assets to freeze and seize, um, uh, should be considered, I think, more. And I think from my recent discussions with some senior members of the AFP, they would be more open to that because traditionally they looked at that sort of 
uh, use of the, the POCO, the Proceeds of Crime Act, as driven by drugs, money, and colorful characters uh, and yeah. boats and yachts rather than um, corporate uh, funds and money in accounts. But yeah. uh, given the, the right facts, they will move. Uh, but I think where we see an interesting flow of money is in fact not into China, it's in fact from China. And it comes into Australia in the real estate sector. Yeah. And because our real estate is considered to be so valuable uh, by not only locals, but by foreign investors who want it as their out of reach bolt hole, that our uh, former head of regulate, uh, co the corporate regulator, who is now a senior OECD official, once uh, colourfully said that Australia was the Caribbean equivalent of the Far East because that's where illegal money came. And um, we had banks who uh, said they spent billions on money laundering um, processes, but uh, seemed not to do much to stop this flow of money coming in and did little to inquire about uh, its sources. Um, that may of course be changing now because our money laundering regulator, Austrac, has extracted billion dollar penalties from major banks over the last two to three years. 1.3 billion this year from Westpac and 700 million from the Commonwealth Bank. So they're on American scale penalties for systemic breaches of um, our money laundering laws and our famous Crown Casino um, is was seeking a license for a casino in Sydney, has been engaging in some of the most egregious money laundering behaviour with Chinese gambling junkets and refused point blank to accept what was plain as vanilla payments and bags of money being exchanged in gambling rooms until it all became out in a public inquiry. So I think our money laundering uh, regulator is probably going to be, over the next few years, one of the most productive regulators because they are a criminal intelligence organization. They're not like a corporate regulator. Mm. They analyze financial data, they look at the flow of money, they report it to the police authorities and they can move and move with considerable power and significant penalties. Um, and, and just on so that- I think, So I think- Sorry. Yeah, sorry, go on. No, no I, was just, I was just going to ask, just, just on that point and, and, and tangentially, I accept, um, is there a, a, a SAR regime in Australia that, that's properly, first of all, is there one? If yes, is it properly enforced and adhered to? Um, <laughs> there is a, a SAR regime and there is a very prescriptive anti-money laundering law, but it is very limited in its reach because it only is effectively applied to the finance, insurance, gambling and cryptocurrency sector, that only recently. Uh, all intermediaries such as lawyers, accountants, real estate agents are not subject to any AML laws. Um, no. So the, the, the benefit of it is, uh, and this is one of the criticisms of the OECD and how money flows into Australia, because many of the transactions, although banks might be part of it, it seems not a lot of the reports are going either to the regulator or they're not being acted upon by banks and therefore money stays in and stays in property. And um, anybody who else is touched with the money, that is lawyers, accountants, third parties, real estate agents, they have no obligation to report anything and have long resisted AML laws even coming anywhere near them. And um, the law council, the accountancy bodies, the real estate bodies have fought it tooth and nail to stop it applying to them because uh, many of their supporters are in government because they're often accountants and lawyers. And they don't believe it should apply because it's too regulatory, too uh, too much of an imposition on them. So they don't like it. Okay, uh, that, again, some, I didn't know that. Um, and I think I'll, I'll <laughs> use the defense of it's too regulatory uh, in, in future cases and see where, that, see where that gets me. I'd imagine not very far, but um, that great, thank you. I, I will actually go to Hong Kong properly now <laughs> and Andrew and ask um, in respect um, of asset recovery in Hong Kong. And, and, and can, I, can I give a working example? So the question I want to uh, posit. Uh, I'm a victim of fraud in, in, with an English judgment. What is the most effective way of finding out if there are attachable assets in your jurisdiction? Um, well, presumably, if, if you've already got your judgment, then uh, I would hope that you've, you've done your homework the moment you found out the fraud, not waited till you've got the judgment, because the money would have disappeared well, uh, well before the judgment from Hong Kong. 
Why? Um, Robert and Hack were both saying it, it's all a matter of speed. Um, we, we would work with the um, investigators in England uh, and the police in Hong Kong to try and freeze those accounts as quickly as possible. Uh, and that can be done literally with a phone call and a, a letter to the bank. Um, and that, that's, that's then followed up with formal orders later. Uh, but it, it can be done relatively quickly. The, the criminal regime, um, if they can find perpetrators here, obviously is to go through the normal uh, anti-money laundering legislation, et cetera, uh, to try and actually catch them if they can to freeze the assets with restraint orders and confiscation orders, et cetera. But that doesn't necessarily help the victim very much apart from somebody being punished for the crime. Mm -hmm. So everything's run in parallel as it does in the other jurisdictions. So the civil boys step in straight away. Yes, with the Norwich Pharmacal applying for confiscation orders. Um, and actually on a case at the moment, a Moravia injunction over all of the assets as well. So they've actually come in. The assets are already seized, but they're seized by the government. So the DOJ have a restraint order over the assets. Hmm. But that means at the end of the criminal trial, because uh, there is a criminal trial going on, um, the confiscation would actually go to the government. But the Moravia would kick in so that if there's a conviction at the end, all the assets are also subject to the civil proceedings brought out by the company, by the alleged victim company. And if there's a conviction at the end, I think it's pretty likely actually the government will give way to the Moravia injunction mm. and allow proceeds of crime to go back to the victim company and not actually be forfeited to the government. Of course, that's only if there's a conviction. If mm. there's a quibble, probably both would fall away. But in a normal case, if somebody hasn't been found, yeah, we, you rush in with garnishy proceedings, try and get the money out of that account. And generally speaking, actually, the police are very helpful. So oh, they are. the anti-corruption, the, yeah, the JFIU, uh, the Joint Financial Intelligence Unit of our Commercial Crime Bureau. And if there's sufficient assets in the account, even before you've made the formal inquiries, if you know them well enough and you've got a good relationship, they'll give you a hint as to whether or not it's actually worth doing civil proceedings on a particular account. Oh, that's very useful. That, 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 that's, a, that's a very, very useful piece. Of yeah. Well, this is where the legislature needs to catch up, though, because you actually need laws to say that you've got a right to know. It shouldn't yeah. depend on your relationship with the Commercial Crime Bureau as to whether you find out how many millions are or are not frozen in that account. But that means that you can rush in with garnishy. Of course, no, um, no defendant ever turns up to actually contest it normally because they're um, in a, another jurisdiction. So mm. if there's money in there, you can get it back. But the problem is, as we've been saying earlier, it's the speed with which you manage to freeze those accounts. That's the problem. Because uh, very often it's gone on the same day. And, and it's, uh, with my judgment, which I, I have, uh, which is recognized by the Hong Kong courts through, through the process which is applied, does that help me in any way in trying to recover assets from mainland China as well? And the, the reason I ask that question is, is on the basis of whether mainland China recognizes the Hong Kong court's enforcement and uh, localization of, of the foreign court's judgment. That's well, a very convoluted sentence, but I think, I think you know what I mean by that. Yeah, I mean, officially, yes, you can uh, try to register judgments in the, the Chinese courts as well as a foreign judgment, but actually enforcing it in mainland China, as you've been saying before, is, is not much problematic. Mm. Yeah, even though you have a recognition, actually acting on that recognition is, is a bit of a problem. So, so, so there's, there's, there's a sort of real hole in the bucket then from, from money, which is come, once it gets into China, it leaks out and, and there is a real difficulty in never getting back. It sounds a bit like a, a, a money launderer's charter in some respects. Is that unfair? Improving, and, and we hope even more so with this Greater Bay Area uh, cooperation, where you're going to have the common law in Hong Kong working side by side with Chinese law. So this yeah. is going to be really interesting. That, 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 I have to say, that is fascinating. That is fascinating. And it may, it, it may change... Um, the way in which we, we bring in orders and judgments overseas in using Hong Kong as a conduit, perhaps conduit jurisdiction to see if we can get any relief 
by going yeah. over and taking it to mainland China. Yeah, there's already cooperation to the extent that Chinese judges have visited Hong Kong and, cr and watched criminal trials and civil trials here yeah. to see what's done in the common law jurisdiction. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I'm just. I'm also keeping an eye on the time, and, uh, and my effective time management has gone completely out the window. I'll be honest. Um, but that's because all of what you said is, I have to say, is just in, uh, is absolutely fascinating. What I'm going to do is ask uh, the attendees whether there are any questions and whether they would kindly put those questions in the chat function on on Zoom. Uh, I'm I'm going to I'm going to carry on for a couple more minutes and just deal with. Uh, with extradition because it's something which I think is is, is so interesting. Um, so if you don't all mind knowing as well, Robert in particular, it's probably uh, two o'clock in the morning or something over there, but for you now, but if you don't mind that we carry on for a, for a few more moments. Not at all, that's fine. That's fine. Topic of extradition. Um, I'm happy to write a note to senior management to say that the reason why you're taking a, a late morning is because you were helping uh, helping us but um uh, i'll be on the, i'll be on the i'll be on the beach i'll be on the beach later in the morning don't there worry was absolutely no need for you to say that there was no need for you to say that at all but uh, <laughs> you said it now no. <laughs> <laughs> um can i start with you then andrew actually um and uh, extradition um and i know you've touched uh, upon this before uh, uh, in terms of uh, how extradition is coming to a sort of a new phase uh, and there are circumstances which are now about which are, 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 are very challenging. And of course, we all know about recent events in terms of the new extradition law. But in the order, in ordinary, the ordinary sense, can you briefly uh, give us a, a, a summary of how the extradition process uh, works in, in Hong Kong? Uh, and my next question after that was, is it effective? But I dare say that's a um, that's a thorny question. So perhaps we could start with a sketch of how the extradition process works? Well, in the past, before the extradition law caused all the social chaos here, um, it was actually very effective. Um, okay. Hong Kong had uh, mutual legal uh, extradition treaties, rather, fugitive offenders ordinance with um, 30 plus different countries. We were regularly dealing with extradition requests to and from England, from Australia, um, all over the world and yeah a very formal process uh, it, it's actually set out in all of the ordinances all the information that's needed of course the dual criminality that I mentioned before is one of the key elements yeah political offense or religious offense etc um, the there are there were lots of negotiations for people coming in from Australia and from England uh, to see if we could possibly get them bail when they land because there's a presumption against bail in extradition cases okay um, so yeah that, that's one of the things that we would tackle but particularly if you know if there was a plea or some other information that could be done yeah um, but outward extraditions yeah we would actually get all of the papers quite detailed papers but of course as, as you all know it's tremendously difficult to stop an extradition because it's not a trial you're not actually dealing with the evidence are you right the, right as in jurisdiction so once you've got the treaty it's only have they met the requirements for extradition. As we all know, the fair trials in, in the requesting country. Yeah. So, you know, we've had people try to prevent their extradition and go through the court of appeal and court of final appeal, et cetera. But in the end, most would be extradited uh, as long as the basic criteria has, has been met. And um, similarly with incoming uh, extradition requests. Originally, there were some in 1997 that said, oh no, Hong Kong is going to be part of China and we can't be sent there. But when it was quickly realized that Hong Kong was very much an independent judiciary, uh, that was dropped. Um, still, a, you know, a first world country with first world prisons, etc. So you couldn't run the defense that you're going into a, a Chinese prison. And yeah. the, you know, the, the fair trials were actually taking place here. So it's quite a lot of extradition work over, over 25 years um, and I, I hope it will begin again once we get through this uh, major issue of reassuring people um, about independence of the judiciary and particularly the national security law and um, there's quite a lot of work to be done there. Yeah well I think across the world we're, 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 we're keeping a keen eye on this because if any for anything else it's, it's a fascinating um, political and, and legal issue so um, 
we we also have our eyes on it from from outside your territory as well. But that that's that's really helpful, Andrew. Thank you very much. Hack, can can I ask you um, about extradition from a Singaporean perspective as well? You've already mentioned um, the issue when it comes to uh, the the death penalty and how some jurisdictions uh, make that a requirement when it comes to seeking or, or, or indeed giving assistance. Um, but in terms of the, the extradition process in Singapore, can you give us a, a, an overview as to how it works? So um, I would say without repeating what Andrew has said, it, it is essentially the same because uh, our extradition act is, is uh, basically based on uh, two uh, parts. One, cooperation with Commonwealth states and Hong Kong is one of them. So we follow more or less the same principles mm. and then foreign states for non-Commonwealth. So uh, when you have uh, Commonwealth state scenarios, it's a lot easier in terms of making sure that you don't even have to have special arrangements or treaties. It's there by, by law. Oh, really? uh, in relation to foreign states, uh, you have to have a specific treaty with that particular country. And of course, observing the dual criminality principles yeah. as well. Now, uh, I would say the, the system works uh, very rigorously. Uh, Every uh, word in the Extradition Act is followed to the letter. And uh, to that extent, you will find that uh, people who are given the warrants of arrest to be apprehended, they are immediately taken into remand and there is no bail, with exception only for a person who is infirm and to be sent to the hospital. That's the only exception. So, 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 so even if you negotiate and um, someone coming into the, uh, the jurisdiction um, uh, pursuant to an expedition request, is it possible for you to, um, to make arrangements so bail would be granted? Or is that just not, it's just not possible? Not possible, not possible. Wow, okay. So uh, in, in this regard, um, you can mount the usual challenges, but as you know, uh, they are very limited. In one particular case, I, I, our famous requester is usually the US of A. Yeah. And in one case, uh, they had multiple requests to Singapore, four or five such requests. And I was involved as the lawyer. And I managed to um, rebuff the Department of Justice uh, in the Singapore courts by pointing out that some elements of the dual criminality was not met. And one of the persons uh, in relation to a sanction to Iran case and uh, he, he was involved in supplying some parts which ended up in Iran. From Iran, it went to Afghanistan, blew up some people in Afghanistan, and uh, the IED was led back to Singapore, and this person was picked up on that basis, even though it was an innocent transmission of an export, you know. But right. he was successful, uh, and then one day, uh, he decided to go on... I mean, he, he was acquitted by the High Court in Singapore yeah. on appeal, and then he decided to go for a short holiday to Indonesia. Uh, there's an island called Batam. And for some reason, the DOJ did not let this man go on the Interpol list. And he was picked up by the Indonesian authorities. And guess what? Indonesia does not have a treaty with the United States. So right. one would think he's safe. But for some reason, they helped him. Americans talked to President Joko Widodo. And Widodo agreed to provide a presidential decree to send him to the US, notwithstanding what happened in Singapore where he got the acquittal. It's bizarre. So despite the acquittal here, he was shipped off to spend another three years in prison in the US of A. Mm. So moral of story is when you get acquitted in a country following a US request, don't travel because, you know. Don't, don't go holiday. Don't, don't go, go holiday. <laughs> yeah, um, fascinating. Um, Robert, you're, 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 you're the final uh, act in our, in our extensive sort of uh, play of, uh, of, of legal constructs around the world. So can, can I ask you, um, uh, in, in respect of extradition from an Australian perspective, you have a statutory scheme in, in Australia, which includes um, the usual uh, grounds to object, which I assume is contained within uh, the statutory framework and which is subject to review by the courts as well. The, the, the question I wanted to ask is, is it effective? Is it an extradition process system uh, which is working in Australia? 
um, are, are there difficulties? Uh, and if I was uh, subject to an Australian extradition request, uh, what would you be telling me before I jumped on a Qantas flight over to Sydney? Uh, it works very well. It works effectively. It's very similar to what Hack has said. We have no uh, predilection for or against bail. We have a different bail regime here, which is a, uh, dealt with quite separately. And unless somebody is a traditional flight risk because of their family habits, spending habits, money habits, assets, um, they could be entitled to, to bail and have some ability to reside in Australia for the purposes of a hearing until it was resolved. But other than that, it works quite effectively. There's domestic extradition between states hmm. for state offences and local domestic offences, and there's um, extensive uh, regulations and uh, treaties between many, many countries. Uh, there was an attempt by the current government in a former guise with a different prime minister to introduce an extradition treaty with China. And that got canned about uh, maybe 18 months ago um, before the virus took effect. But it's, it's, it was part of, I think, um, part of the American influence that pervades the Australian government in um, not so much a, an anti-China, but doing something which was uh, not seen as particularly helpful to the Trump regime. Right. And it also had a lot of people who, in the, in the conservative side of politics and in the Labour side, who were concerned about uh, treaties with China where people would disappear um, and never be seen again. And that died a natural death and has died an even more natural death this year um, with uh, focus on foreign interference and criminal laws that are targeted clearly directly to China and the conduct of Chinese officials and people representing the Chinese government in how they deal with people in Australia. So yes, it works extensively, it works well, and it's subject to quite rigorous uh, testing and to judicial review. Well, I'm afraid I'm going to have to interject at this point, fascinating though it is to say that we have uh, run out of time and I've started, I am going to finish, so there's not going to be any more questions or answers <laughs> submitted um, under, certainly with my hat on. Um, can I just take this opportunity though to thank you guys very much indeed for taking yeah, the time to share these, um, well, the fabulous insights that you've given us from across the globe. We are very, very grateful indeed uh, for the time that you've afforded us all. Um, can I also take this opportunity to thank very much all of the delegates that are tuned in to listen um, to this um, fascinating, um, uh, well, these fascinating topics that we've heard today. Uh, and can I also mention, because obviously I've been asked to do so, that the Magical Mystery Tour moves on tomorrow. We spin the globe again and we head to Europe. We've got a fantastic lineup by way of panel. Please don't hesitate to register for that fantastic experience, which is going to take place tomorrow. And with that, thank you all very much indeed and goodbye.